Hello everyone, we are so glad you have stopped by our YouTube channel. Through the years, we have gathered many wonderful sermons, and we decided we should share them with you. If you enjoy, we ask you would like, comment, and subscribe. Please leave a comment telling us what your favorite part of the sermon is. Also, since some of the recordings are from cassette tape, we do not have all the information. If you have information on the recording, please leave it in the comment. Thank you, and may God bless you. Jeremiah chapter 17. We'll start reading at verse number 5. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Praise God. I want to preach to you for just a few moments about a warrior of God. Savior, we're so grateful for another time to give you glory and worship and praise. We're thankful for the anointing that you have poured out already in this house. Lord, I'm thankful for what I'm feeling coming over me right now. Lord, as I felt it in prayer some time ago, and oh God, even as fresh as a few moments ago, touch these young peoples in our hearts and our lives as we'll advance your cause. We will not sit down. We will not give in. We will not surrender. But Lord, we'll move on. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted, Amen. Everybody shouted, Praise the Lord. Everybody shouted, God is great. Everybody shouted unto God a hallelujah. Say it again. Say it again. Oh, you're doing good. But I guarantee you, you can do better than that. Come on, one more time from way down deep on the inside of you. Let it come with a great big shout of hallelujah. Everybody together. The devil's on the run. Hell is coming down. Uh, the kingdom of this world is going to come down. And God is being lifted up. And when he's lifted up, all men are drawn unto him. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. 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 This age in which we live has bewildered many a youth. There are young folks who have come to this convention in the year 1987. And you have come with questions. You have come with fear. You have come with confusion. There are so many great things of this world and her sad plight that has so embattled the mind of young people that they don't know which way to turn. While this year, suicide has reared his ugly head once again, and they're taking the lives of many precious youth. Just the other day in Dallas, from a rich family, a family that had popular fame across the great United States, the Von Erich family, a family that is in stature, that is strong and mighty, 
that can grapple in a wrestling ring. They have belts. They have trophies. They have wealth. They have money. They have the name that people look up to. They're, we've read in the newspaper they're in Dallas with their pictures. Uh, and they're so, uh, the fans scream and holler. And everybody, it seems, loves the Von Erichs. They filled, they put more people in Texas Stadium than the Cowboys did. But on Tuesday, one of the Von Erichs, with all of his money, with all of his fame, with all that he had going for him, took a drive out by one of the lakes. And he wrote a note and he said, I've gone to a better place. The confusion and the fear and these questions that haunt me. And they found his body some 600 yards from that car where he had taken his own life. And there are young people that suicide looks them in the eyes. Pentecostals shout the victory while others set and they look at the times of prophecy and they see it happening all around and they become afraid of the age of Armageddon and they refuse to sow the seeds and they've worried so much about the Antichrist that they do not hear and have no time for Jesus Christ. They don't reap the harvest of God and neither do they know revival now. Many of you have become satisfied with the status quo of having the luxury of the church to call your own. While widespread wickedness uh, is creeping up uh, and grabbing a hold of your life uh, and threatening to ruin you and cast you into outer darkness uh, where there is the gnashing of teeth. We believe in revival, but many look to the revival of yesteryear and not for me today. I'm too young. God can't use me. They think in terms of a small God, and so they have small power. They look at the greatness of sin and its appeal of its pleasure and the false religions, the Moonies, the Mormons, the Hare Krishnas, and etc. And it, they seem like they prevail. And it looks like odds are too great for there to be revival in the young people of America. Someone said that this generation condones what the last generation condemned. That time is the great sanctifier of sin. And that the sin of today becomes okay tomorrow. And so it rocks on in our lives. But I want you to study the revivals of the Bible. And study the revivals of mankind. And you will learn, as I did, that against all amazing odds, God was always able to deliver revival. It didn't matter where, it didn't matter when, uh, there was revival. The walls had fallen, the walls had crumbled, uh, Israel was in captivity, but there was a cupbearer that was weeping and crying out to God, uh, and God touched one man uh, and sent him back to a fallen, beaten down city, and raised some walls, uh, and raised the city, and raised revival, uh, so uh, that prophecy could be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Revival came after some 400 years of when men did not hear from God and God had not spoken to them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees with their formality and unbelief, uh, they had made the religion of the Jews uh, into some powerless thing of a dead letter without any heart. Uh, there was no contact with God. Uh, but God touched a man who touched him. Uh, and in the womb of his mother, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he shut himself out from others. Uh, he shut himself out from society. And he said, oh God, uh, I've got to be ready. Uh, I want revival. God, I want it your way. And he came preaching revival. And God gave John the Baptist revival. 
You can have revival, young man. You can have revival, young lady. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter the church you attend. It doesn't matter the high school or junior high. It doesn't matter the neighborhood. It doesn't matter where the sin is. It doesn't matter what's going on. You can have revival. From the valley of Texas, uh, they're crying out revival. Uh, in the big cities of Houston and Dallas, they're crying revival. Uh, in the small villages and towns, uh, they're crying revival. God has revival, and he's got it for you, young man. He's got it for you, young lady. He's got it in your youth group. He's got it in your church. Hallelujah. And the war is on. Satan against God and the battlefield is in the lives of mankind. It's not flesh and it's not blood. Our battle is not against the flesh and the blood. Flesh and blood methods are fine. Flesh and blood methods are okay. But by themselves, they're no match for the devil. The devil doesn't really get all excited about our flesh and blood methods and ideas. They'll hurt him, but oh, not like it when we move into the arena of prayer and fasting and revival of the Spirit. Most people are fighting a battle that is already lost because they're fighting that battle in the flesh. Instead of accepting a victory, it's already been won in the spirit. We're warriors. If you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you've been filled with the Holy Ghost power, you have the power of the Almighty God living inside of you. And I want to preach for another few moments about that kind of power. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 tells us that the devil is the God of this world. But in 1 John 3 and 8, let's us know that the purpose of Jesus Christ was to destroy the works of the devil. The devil has supernatural power. He occupies a superior position and he exercises supernatural power over mankind. He is the supreme ruler of all that is evil. He's so full of deception. He's able to destroy and seduce mankind. He is the mastermind behind all of the rebellion and hatred that's towards God. He is powerful. He is evil. But you remember Remember this one little thing, young man, young lady, he has been defeated. He is a defeated foe. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, 18 tells us that Jesus has all power in the heaven and in the earth. And if the devil's the God of this world, then he has no power. Because my God has all power in the heaven and in the earth. Brother Hurst, I want us to go to Luke 11, verses 21 and 22. When, I want you to pay attention to this. When a strong man... Just a minute here. This is where Jesus Christ is talking about the devil. And he's talking about the few verses down after these. About how that when the devil goes out of a man, he will come again. And if there is no power there, he will go and get seven others worse than himself and bring them in. He's talking about how in heaven, it was with the little finger of God that Satan was cast out of heaven. He's talking about the power of Satan. Read. Okay. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace. His goods are in peace. His goods are there. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him. And overcome He's talking him. about the devil. Yeah. The devil is keeping his palace. His palace is this earth. He's trying to keep everything there. That's the only time the devil really knew peace was before Jesus Christ came. He had peace upon the earth. It was the way he wanted it. He called the shots. He kept his house. He was the strong man. But what happened, Brother Hurst? But when a stronger than he is come upon him. But a stronger him. than he came. Hallelujah. A stronger than he came. Oh, the devil had power. 
The devil had strength. The devil had it going his way. But oh, friend, there came a time when there was one that was stronger than him who came upon the scene. Stronger than he. Like what did it. this one do, Brother Hurst? And overcame him. And overcame him. Yeah. When the stronger came, he didn't say, well, we're going to set up peace talks. No. And we're going to negotiate a little no. bit. He didn't say, we're going to sit around here and try to see how we can do it. Oh, no. When the stronger than he came, he overcame him. What did he do, brother? He taketh from him all his armor. He taketh. Remember, he's taking it from the devil. He taketh from the devil all. Everybody say all. all. Come on, say all. all. Say all. all. All his armor. Read that again. He taketh from him. He taketh from him. All. All his, his armor. armor. When Jesus came and overcame the devil, he took all of his armor from him and left him defenseless. Woo. Good preaching, good preaching, good preaching. Oh my. Yeah. Hallelujah. What the devil had wrapped around mankind for so long. It said, you're my captive. You're my prisoner. Oh, friend, Jesus came. It said, take your hands off of him. I'm taking your armor. I'm taking all that you have. I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to put it under my feet. I'm going to show the world just who you really are. Come on, young man. Let it dawn on you. The devil don't have any armor. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. What? You want to finish that scripture? My God. <laughs> Sitting around thinking about how bad the devil is. He's naked. He don't have any armor. Read on here, brother. Okay. He taketh all his armor he taketh wherein all his he armor. trusted. Wherein he trusted. Like Everything that. that the devil trusted I in, like God took it from him. This is the best part. <sighs> all right. You see what's happening? The devil thinks he's got it. Yeah. Why does he have to use mysteries? Why does he have to hide it in darkness? Why does he have to use deception? Because he don't have no armor. And he's got to hide. And he's hoping that fact will never dawn on you. Because the devil don't have nothing to trust in except what we give him. What a young man or young lady will give to the devil. That's what he can then trust in. That's all he can use against you. That's all the power the devil can have. But friend, when you look him in the eye and say, uh-uh, buddy, you don't have anything. Everything you trusted in, every ounce of armor, why, get out of here, you old slew foot. You don't have a leg to stand on. All right, read again, brother. And divideth his spoils. All right. <laughs> Divideth his spoil. That's us. Who did he divide it with? You and me. Yeah, the, church. the church of the living Whoa. God. When God overcame the devil and took his armor and all that he trusted in, he said, all right, church, I'm going to let you be in the earth. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And also, you're going to rule what once was the kingdom of the devil. That's, that's why, Brother McGuire, God looked down and he took fallen humanity and said, I'm going to raise up out of them a masterpiece. I'm going to put in them oh, that same thing that the devil trusted in. I'm going to put in them my power, my might, my glory. That's why the Apostle Paul lived for the devil and wreaked havoc and was a, an A number one champion for the devil. But God looked down and said, I want him. 
And the devil said, "Uh uh-uh, you can't have him. And Jesus just shined some light on him. Knocked him off more than his donkey. Knocked him off his high horse. And when he fell and he saw all that light, he saw what the devil had. And he said, man, there's nothing here. There's no future in this. And that's when he said, who art thou, Lord? Lord is also mentioned in the Bible as being Elohim. And Trinitarians like to say Elohim talks about their deity being three. But wait a minute. And the Lord said, I am Jesus. When he come down off the high horse, when he got the light on in his life, and he saw what the devil had, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Come on, Isaiah. Fit your eyes off of your kingly monarch of this world and lift up your eyes. There's another king on the throne. There's another king who's wanting to fill your temple. Devil don't have no arm. Everybody say, Devil don't have no arm. We stay there a while, but we got to move on here. That's why he uses wiles and tricks and other methods. Revelation 12 9 says that he has, has deceived the whole world. He uses deceit. John 8 44 says he's the father of liars and he's been a liar from the beginning. He'll use lie. He's a false teacher. Uh, it's already been mentioned from Revelation 12 and 10. He is an accuser of the brethren before God day and night. Genesis 3 and 1, when he came to Eve, he said, hath God said, and he was putting doubt into her mind. He loves to use doubt when he tempted Jesus in that place of temptation. He looked at him in Matthew 4 and 3 and said, if thou be the son of God. He's coming with doubt. The devil uses those methods and those tricks. But you hear me? He is limited. He's fast, but he's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. He's smart, but he doesn't know everything. He's tricky, and he is strong, but he's not all powerful. He is defeated. His kingdom's coming down. God has him under his feet. There's victory over him. What does that leave you and me? Now, if the devil don't have any power, no armor, except just for what we'd give him. What do you and I fit in? I'm glad you asked. Read out of 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. We know. Boy, that's confidence. I like it. Everybody say, we know. We We know. know. That's you and that's me. We know. Uh Whoever is born of God sinneth sinneth not. not. Friend, you can be born again. All you've got to do is repent of your sins. I'm sorry, but you've got to do more than turn on your headlights one time and blink them. You've got to do more than honk a horn and shake a preacher's hand. You've got to do more than sign a little card. You've got to do more than just turn over a new leaf. You've got to repent. You've got to tell God you're sorry. You've got to come. And then, friend, you're baptized in the name of Jesus. And you're filled with the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues. Until all that happens, you're not born again. That's it. Read on now. What verse is 18? We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. But he. Everybody say he. He. He that is begotten of God yes. keepeth Keep. himself. I like that. Read. First John 5, 18. Okay, keepeth himself. And that wicked one and that wicked one, there he is again. Touch that wicked one not. is the devil. If I say the devil, the devil. Come on, say the devil. the devil. That wicked one touch.
toucheth him not. You know what I'm preaching right now? There is a place that a young man and young lady can live to where that wicked one, that devil, can't even touch him. Now that's going to blow a lot of people right out of the water. I mean, the devil gets on them every day, and they just got to have the struggle, and they can just barely get by. But I'm telling you, if you'll keep yourself, son, if you're begotten of God, if you'll walk with God, there's a place that where that old wicked one who don't have any armor can't touch you. Now, it just makes sense. Since he don't have any armor... He's going to try to come using methods of deception and mysteries and the such. But God has taken his armor and that which he trusted in and has divided it among the church. All right, read me out of Luke there, brother. Luke 10, 19. Luke Behold, 10, 19. I give unto you power. Behold. This is Jesus talking. Yeah. He's talking to you. Yeah. He's talking to me. Yeah. He's not talking to the devil. Right. He's talking to us. Then we're going to do the talking to the devil. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents. To tread on serpents. Who yes. came in the form of a serpent? It was the devil, that old serpent. Friend, he can't hurt you. He can't touch you. But you can walk on him. Satan, your kingdom's coming down. Satan, your kingdom's coming down. Brother, go there. We're going to crush it. We're going to stomp it to pieces. All right, read on here. Snakes and... Oh, it said serpents. Serpents and scorpions. And I could stay on each one of these and preach I mean for a long time. It took me about five or six Sundays to preach this to my church in Dallas. But friend, there's something in here. Oh, he's giving I mean, you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And over... Everybody say all. all. Over all, all the power of the enemy. Uh-huh. You, you yeah. You mean peer pressure? You mean dope, cigarettes, alcohol, rock and roll, country and western? You mean the movies? You mean the cosmetics? You mean the dressing like this world? And my wife is showing me pictures in the Dallas paper. And she said, it looks like the hymn lines are coming up. I said, some of them are. But there's going to be some. They're going to go hold the line. Well, there is. All right, read on there, brother. And nothing. Ah, Now, wait a minute. No, it said nothing. You're going to have power to walk up on the serpents Uh and the scorpions. And you're going to have power over all the enemy. Well, this is good preaching. (laughs) And what else, brother? Boy, this is good right here. Y'all hang on. (laughs) Read it to him, son. That last part. And nothing. And nothing. And nothing. And nothing. Shall. Shall. Bye. Shall. 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 Okay. I want you to get this. Nothing. Shall. Nothing. Shall. What's the next word? Bye. Bind. Any. Any. Means. Hurt you. Is that what you want? Okay. Don't pay attention. Hallelujah. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Some of y'all heard me tell this story as I preached around this district. I was driving home from church one evening. It's on Wednesday night. My wife and I come driving home. I went home a different way. Don't know why I did it. Driving home. Looked over in the tavern and I saw a truck. Recognized that truck. I said, man, that looks like one of my men. Did a mental note. No, he wasn't at church tonight. I wheeled in the parking lot. My little precious wife raising the church. She said, man, where are you going? 
I said, I'm going to pull up here and make sure whether or not that's his truck. I went and looked. Saw his tools. I recognized it. Come back to the car, and I said, pray for me. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going in that tavern. My knees were knocking together. Oh, my hands were shaking. But as I walked away, I heard somebody praying for me. I said, hey, fooey on this. I'm going into the kingdom of hell. And I'm not going to let the devil take him. Because nothing can hurt me. Not as long as I'm keeping myself. Not as long as I'm walking with him. Not as long as my hand's in his hand. Friend, you can have confidence uh, when you're walking with God. It's when you get out of step of God that you lose your confidence. uh, And you become frustrated. And you don't know what to do. Hallelujah. I opened that door. I strolled in there. I walked in there. Yeah, stormed. I stormed in there. We're storming the gates of hell. I walked in there. It was dark. It's always dark where the devil is. It's always dark because he don't have no armor. And he's got to cover up his nakedness. And he's got to make you think he has power. He'll send one little demon to you and tell you there's 10,000 of them when all there is is one. And you're scared to death of me. You don't know what to do. I'm possessed. And all you've got to do is turn the light on at Jesus Christ and say, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus. I walked in. It was dark. I had to stand there a while, shake my head, get And when they were weeping and crying, it was either for happiness and joy or it was in repentance of godly sorrow. But this guy was weeping over some gal who had left him. And another one was over there trying to hustle up a girlfriend. And others were carrying their beer around. And I spied my man across the room. And I started moving towards him. As I walked towards him, everybody got out of my way. I thought, man, what is this? Then it dawned on me. I'm an alien uh, in this situation. Uh, I'm from another world. Uh, I've got God. Uh, I've got light shining out from me. Uh, and the devil's got to pull his people back. Uh, he's got to get them away from the light uh, so that they cannot discover that he's naked. I walked up to that table where my man was kneeling down over it, had that long stick in his hand, looking down it like a gun, sighting in on a little white ball, and had all kinds of other balls scattered across the green carpet of that table. And he's lining up. I don't know what those other guys did that were standing around with him, but they were guilty of it, whatever it was. I walked up there. They all backed away. I tapped him on the shoulder. He jumped and turned around, saw it was his preacher. His eyes filled with fear. I saw it immediately. The power of Satan was coming face to face with a man who refused to say no to the devil. It said, I'm going to take it, Satan. Uh, You can tell me no all you want to, but I'm going to take it. He looked at me and he said, my wife told you where I was. I said, no, she didn't. She wasn't even at church. I hadn't talked to her. She's probably at home waiting with dinner on you, praying for you. Tears started washing down his face. He saw the nakedness of the devil. He saw that the devil had no armor. And he fell upon my neck. And he began to weep and sob and cry. And ask God to touch him right then. I said, you pick up your bags and get out of this place. And you get home where you belong. He said, preacher, I'm right behind you. Oh, what are you preaching? I'm preaching that when you walk with God, nothing's going to hurt you. He can't lay a hand on you. By any means, the Bible said, there's no way. When you got the Holy Ghost, the crowd can't move you. When you're walking in God, temptation can't get you. When you're stepping out in the holiness of the Word of God, the devil can't touch you. All right, now, I'm going to close. I'm going to close, but it's going to be just a little bit. (laughs) Now, if he can't touch you and you got to keep yourself, there's a way that you got to keep yourself. Find him a brother and be strong in the Lord. 
and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or tricks of the devil. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. God's not looking for a little old namby, pamby, sissy, pushover that's always looking for the easy way out. Well, everybody else goes to movies. Why can't I go? Because he said no. Everybody else cuts their hair. Why can't I cut my sister? His word says no. Well, everybody else does this or that. Why can't I do it? Oh, friend, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. When you get down on your knees and you weep before God and you get strong in the Lord and the power of his might, you'll see it differently. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood you're wrestling against. But we wrestle against principalities and powers. And rulers of darkness of this world. And spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And we're living in an evil day. And homosexuality is glorified. When it's all right. To walk hand in hand with the world. You know what this generation has done? They have lifted up God. They have turned their backs upon the philosophies of the 60s that said God is dead. They're saying, yes, God is great. The news writers are saying revival is in America. But wait a minute, there's something wrong with it. Now they're saying the devil's dead. Now they're saying we buried the devil. And we can do anything we want to. We can live like we want to. We can act like we want to. We can praise his name. We can shout and talk in tongues and go out with another man's wife. We can drink and sip our wine and alcohol and live in sin and come to God and read his word and talk to him and praise him. After all, he's a God of love. That's what's happening in the 80s because the devil is wrestling with men's soul. Rock and roll's not just merely dealing with sex now. This country and western's not just dealing with sex now. No, they moved into another realm, the occult. And they're wrestling for your soul. And they want you to put the gun to your head. They want you to take the overdose or turn the motor on and let that uh, poison come from that engine and fill that car and let you die. Because once you're dead without God, there's not another chance. And so we got to put on that whole armor of God. Hallelujah. Gird up your loins with truth. This world is living in lies, and they're believing lies. We need to put on truth. We need to buy the truth and sell it not. Alcohol won't bring you a good life. For a while it will, but the end is tragic. The dope world, the rock and roll world, this sinful world is not going to lift you up all the time. In the end, it's death. Preach it to you right now. I feel the anointing right now. Hear me now. Oh, friend, we need truth. We need truth. If there's a cry in your heart, let it be, oh, God, I got to know truth. The girdle is that that held on the pieces of armor, held them in place. In the ancient soldier's battle dress. Without that armor, the other pieces of armor would rattle about and would burn and chaff and hurt the man. And so he had to have his truth. He had to have his girdle in place. I'm preaching we need to gird up our loins with truth. We need to protect our most vital organs. We need to walk forward and know that God is the truth, the life, and the way. And if any man cometh to the Father, he'll come by Jesus. You got to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Put on the preparation of the gospel of peace on your feet. What is that? Get out there and do something. Be ready. Don't be a bench warmer. Don't be one that just comes to church and sits down. Don't just be one that kind of sits around and judges, but be one that will come into the house of God and say, I'm going to give him glory. I'm going to give him honor. Preach it, pastor. Get with it, evangelist. Amen. I'm bringing somebody to God. I'm praying in an altar for them. I'm praying. 
Then you put on that breastplate of righteousness. That's right standing with God. The breastplate will protect your heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 tells me that the heart is deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? And that God tries the reins of the heart to see who's in control. You better put on that breastplate because you do not know the evil that lurks inside your breast today. You don't know the evil that lurks inside your mind. Hear me, young man back here. Hear me now, young lady that's talking. Hear me. You do not know the evil that's lurking within you. One day they shouted Hosanna, and the next they were saying crucify him. One day you're in a Pentecostal youth convention, and the next day you could be in the den of Satan. Got to take up that shield of faith. Jesus is our faith. Thank you, Brother McGuire, for that message today. Jesus literally took everything that the devil could throw at him. Read for me Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I live. They tell you, if you live for God, you're going to be a holy roller. You might as well die. That's right. I'm going to die. But I'm crucified with him. And when I die with him, nevertheless, I live. Yeah. When the rest of the world dies, I'm going to be shouting the victory. When the rest of them are dead in hell, living forever there, I'm going to be shouting the victory with God Almighty. Read on. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Yet Christ not I. liveth within me. Christ liveth in me. But Christ liveth in me. Yes. Read. And the life which I now I live now. in the flesh. Hear it now. This was not God talking. This is a man like you and me. Uh, but the life which I now live in the flesh. I live. That means right now I'm yes. living in the flesh. I live by the faith of the by Son the of God. By the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me. Who loved me. And gave and himself, gave himself, for, himself me. for me. Uh, Friend, take up that shield of faith. Whereby you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and the life that you now live. You're living in the faith of the Son of God who died for you. You know what that means? Come here. Put that mic down. Come here. He's bigger than I am. Come here, brother. Hunt, you play the devil. I'm over here shouting the victory. I'm having me a good time at youth convention. Now here comes a devil, and he's going to try to get me. Come on, devil. Here he comes. I'm going to live in Jesus. Get him, Jesus. Come on, get him, Jesus. Get him, Jesus. Friend, any temptation, whatever comes your way, you live the life in the flesh, in the life of Jesus Christ. My God. Go tell Jesus on the devil. It'll work. I gotta hurry here. I gotta hurry. The helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet of salvation. The weapons of all warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Hallelujah. And every high thing which does exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. To the obedience of Jesus Christ. You buckle on that helmet. Oh, friend. Hallelujah. You've girded on that belt of truth. And then you step out and you put on that breastplate of righteousness. Oh, you're feeling better now. Oh, then you stepped out there and you buckled on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Yeah. And then above all, you picked up a shield of faith. Yeah. You buckled on that helmet of salvation. And the devil's getting scared. First Thessalonians 5, 8 says, For an helmet, the hope of salvation. Isaiah 59, 17 says, He, talking about God, put on a breastplate of righteousness and for a helmet, salvation. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 5 and 8, For a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope in the Greek means confident expectation. The mind that is confidently expecting victory cannot be won over by the lies of the devil that will depress and defeat. Put on the whole armor of God. Friend, you got victory. Then, 
You pick up a weapon. The only weapon mentioned. You pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, it's quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder. Oh, it'll pierce even the joint marrow. Friend, you're standing now. You're all dressed up. You put on the armor. You're ready now. But wait a minute. You know what you got on? You got on Jesus. Because he is the truth. He is the peace. He is the uh, preparation of the gospel of peace. He is the righteousness. He is the faith. He is our hope. He is our assurance. Romans 13, 14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He is in us and he is on us. He's on the inside and he's on the outside. Now, when you get Jesus, you get holiness on the inside. You get holiness on the outside. It's not just one way. It's all the way. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. But now you're all dressed up. And that's where most people lose it. They're all dressed up. They got on the whole armor of God, but what are you going to do? The next verse says, and pray, and pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. A lot of people are all dressed up to go, preachers, but they don't have anywhere to go. When they put on that whole armor of God, that's the time to go pray. Praying always with all prayer. There's all kinds of prayer. But oh, friend, hear me now. Jesus has already won the victory over the devil. And he's passed that victory on to you and I. We put on Jesus in the form of the armor of God. And now we're ready to do something. It's in prayer that you put the devil in his place. It's in prayer that you subdue temptation. It's in prayer that you overcome. Oh, we'll shout over holiness. We'll shout over giving it all to God. But oh, friend. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need a revival of prayer. Praying always with all prayer. Talked about all that armor. But the only thing it said doing always was prayer. Prayer. Romans 8, 37. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors means more than just getting the victory. It means gaining the benefits of that victory. Yeah. All right, I'm closing. For real. They're sitting down there. Inside the camp is death. Outside the city is the enemy. And they're surrounded. Four leprous men. They're saying, we sit here, we're going to die. We go in the city, they're going to stone us. Oh, I sit here and die. Let's go against the host of the enemy. Four crippled up old lepers. Maybe one of them had a hand missing. Another one had an ear. Half a face. Their limbs were maimed and crippled. But here they come. They're marching. Maybe they're dragging one of their companions. But they're coming. They're moving against the enemy. But what's happening? Something's going on in the enemy's camp. One of them wakes up and says, Hey, do you hear that? That sounds like the rumbling of Egypt. Another one says, Oh, wait a minute. That sounds like they've gathered about the, the Hittites. Man, something's going on. Hey, we got to get out of here. Man, they didn't pause long enough to get an armor out of any. Oh, they didn't get nothing. They left the sword. They left the spear. They left the helmet. They left their shoes. They left their food. They left their tents. They left it all. And four little old cripples walked into the camp and said, man, look what we got. What are you doing, little leper? Oh, it hadn't come into being yet. I guess it's all right to do it. It hadn't been written down by Paul yet. But Brother Godair, Brother McGuire, I guess it's all right if I put on the whole armor of God and just start marching toward the enemy. All I can do is trust in God. I don't have anything. I don't have no wealth. I don't have no popularity. 
They don't like me. I don't have no strength. I don't have no armor. But all I got is Jesus. I got Jesus. And I'm going to march. Friend, if all you got is Jesus, you got more than this whole world ever thought about heaven. The devil's naked and you got the armor. Start marching. Start marching. Start marching. I was in my office, there came a call. I said, out front of the church, there's a man wanting to see you. I walked out front with one of the men. It's a great big tall man. His arms were as big as one of my legs. He stood head and shoulders above me, glaring at me. He said, preacher, I hate you. I said, well, you're not the first one. He said, I've been sent here by the devil himself. And the devil don't like what's going on on this corner of this city. And he sent me to kill you. About that time, I felt the presence of the Almighty God. <sighs> Hallelujah. Where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. I fell for that helmet. I fell for that shield. I was looking for that breastplate and that girdle. I was looking for those shoes. I was looking for that sword. Yeah, they're all there. He said, I'm going to kill you. I said, no, you're not. And I looked him in the eyes. When the first time I saw the devil's eyes. And he put those big old arms out in front of him with big hands. I've never seen such big hands. And he started walking towards me. The man that was standing there. He said, Brother Foster, what are we going to do? I said, pray. And I said, sir, while you're praying, pray for me. He come at me. He was in a crouch. I didn't know what kung fu or whatever it was. But I put Jesus on him. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus stood up inside of me. I said, in Jesus' name. He come at me and he put his hands right there. I didn't flinch. I just looked him in the eye and said, in Jesus' name. He tried. I said, in Jesus' name. I said, in Jesus' name, come out of him. In Jesus' name, get on your knees. I didn't lay hands on him. I just spoke the word. And all of a sudden, he just went limp. And he fell to his knees and started weeping and sobbing and crying. And he said, I'm sorry, preacher. I'm sorry. Then I laid hands on his head. And I began to pray for him. And it wasn't long until the Holy Ghost began to come from his mouth. Oh, friend. He, Wednesday night, he was on the front row of my church. I know what I'm preaching. I'm preaching to you. You're God's warrior. You got power. You got might. You got glory. You're not just anybody. You're a child of God. You're a young man walking with God. You're a young lady going with Jesus. Let's stand our feet, lift our hands, and worship God. Hallelujah. There's revival wherever you are. There's revival wherever you are. Come on, let's march to the front of this church. Come on. Don't stop at the aisle. Come all the way to this altar. Come all the way to this altar. Come on, hurry up. Run. Run. Hurry. Hurry. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Come to God. Come to God. Come to God.